today we come to the book of 1 Corinthians. We've just finished Romans and in Romans we see the foundation laid, the gospel. We see in Romans we have learned that God reveals His righteousness through the gospel. Then we see that God produces, creates a new race under Jesus Christ. A totally different human race as opposed to the sinful, corrupted, selfish race of Adam. Then in Romans, we see how the church was unified. The Greeks, the Gentiles, and the Jews in the church in Rome, how they were to learn to live together. So we see here in Romans, in the book of Romans, a foundation and a model. And we come up with this idea that, wow, all the churches in the New Testament are so wonderful. You know, solid foundation of the gospel, a new race in Jesus, a born-again race of people, humanity, and a unified church. Then we come to the book of Corinthians, and we find the worst church in the entire New Testament. Right? We find a church that has divisions, immorality, they sue one another, you know, they divide on the little issues, they have no clue about the resurrection, you know, they are so vague on it, all right? And so we have our, our idea of the model church is shattered in a sense. You see, there are a lot of Christians who believe that Wow, my church is really messed up, but you know, I wish we could go back to the days of maybe John Wesley, or maybe the Puritans, or maybe even the uh, New Testament type of churches. It would be so wonderful. You know, they always say, wow, I wish I was at a time of Jesus. I could walk around with Jesus. I don't think you want to walk around with Jesus. 19% of us can't even handle that, right? And then there'll be the crowds around Jesus just to have a little look of Jesus is going to be a strain on your eyes. But you say, I wish I was at the time of Jesus. You know, we have this very uh, almost immature idea. Today we have the Holy Spirit with us. Isn't that so much better? Jesus Christ lives in us through his Holy Spirit. We have a personal partner that we is 24 7. Jesus, you can hardly be one minute with him because of the crowds. Right, And so we have this very wrong idea of looking back, never thankful for what we have, right? And never hopeful for what we will be getting in the near future, right? So this is the problem with the sinful nature of men, always the good old days, never thankful for the present days, okay? So we see here this idea that once we are justified, you know, which is a step, we trust in Jesus as our Savior. It's a step of justification. That moment you have exchanged place, His perfect life becomes yours. Your sins taken by Him. In that one transaction, you are just in the eyes of Almighty God. Right? But then the process of sanctification, as I said, is a journey. And it's a long, difficult journey as we put our trust in the Lord to help us step by step overcome the old nature that is still in us, in our mind, in our desire, we want to be like Christ, but our flesh still gossips, you know, still lazy, you know, still uh, all the, the old habits, the sinful nature, so much there. The good that I would, I do not. But the evil that I would not, that I do, all right? That's the struggle even of Apostle Paul in Romans, okay? So the journey of sanctification is a long journey, but the issue is not how fast you go. That's not the main issue. The main issue is that are you in the right direction? Are you day by day on the right road to becoming more and more like Christ? not saved from hell and then left the sinful 
horrible person you were. Saved from hell, right? And given the potential to be more and more like Christ. Now, how much you grab that potential, right, is up to you. You grab it by faith. Every time you want to do something sinful, you remember Christ through His Holy Spirit lives in you and say, Lord, help me. I don't want to do this. I need your strength. I need your love. I need your kindness. I need your patience. Lord, your patience, please. And then by faith, that is given to you moment by moment. Right? The journey of sanctification is a moment by moment journey. It's not a one step, right? You're, you're saved once. You receive Christ once as your Savior. The judge justifies you once. Just. That's justification. Sanctification moment by moment. All right? Now, let's look at the city of Corinth. What kind of city was it? Corinth is very much like Singapore. It was at a strategic location on the Greek peninsula, right? And an isthmus, and it was like a perfect port at that place right so it was geographically a very international place bustling great business place people were very prosperous in in corinth because of its location right and so there were a lot of newly rich people many made money there lots of money number two it was also a religious place there was huge temple to the goddess of love aphrodite aphrodite right a p h r o d i t e aphrodite right and this was a horrible temple because the goddess of love of course what do you mean by that they worshiped by having sex in the temple they were reputedly at that time when paul was there were two thousand temple prostitutes right so we thought that in the canaanite religion of uh, sex religion had died no no it was continued on Baal continued outside of the promised land it was it was no more in the promised land it continued in the greek religion the temple of aphrodite or aphrodite all right now so obviously though they were rich and they had a lot of money they were very immoral to the people of corinth because it's like normal to have uh, uh sex even in religion so what's wrong with sex in anything else sex was part of their life very much like here sex is in every part of our life you can't you can't sell a book you can't go have a good movie you can't crack a good joke unless there's sex in it that's our culture we live in it's so so pervasive until we Forget how pervasive it is. Number three, so it was business. It was an immoral place, all right? Wealthy, immoral. And then it was under Roman law. It was a Roman city. And so the people were very used to law and they sued one another like nobody's business, all right? So you find that also in the church, okay? So these are some of the things. Under the fourth problem with this place was it was very Greek in its philosophy. And we said, who is that? What's that going to do with us? We are very Greek in our philosophy because our whole educational system, our medical system, everything has come down to the Western civilization. The Greeks influence the Western civilization. Whether you like it or not, we so-called Asians who have been educated have been educated in a very Western way. So we have a very Greek kind of mindset. Like I said earlier, medicine, we separate the body and the rest. We're not holistic as opposed to Asian medicine where we consider the person as one. In in uh, Western medicine, it's the body, cells. Cells got nothing to do with the emotion. And as a doctor for many years, I can tell you, the body and the mind are so intertwined and the emotions are so intertwined, you could get sick, right? Just by being mentally sick. Or spiritually sick you could be physically sick because it's all intertwined but in the Greek mind no medicine is the study of biology just the cells it's not the the, the study of other parts with you cellular study same with our spiritual Greek mindset we go into church and we want to do Bible study and we can be a very very respected Christian 
whose life has never been a day of mercy, never won evangelism in their life, and yet they can be a professor of theology, right? Because it's, it's all about the mind. The mind is superior in the Greek, right, to the body. And so it's very much our Christianity today. A good Christian is one who knows more verses than the other. The other one who doesn't know a single verse and has been praying for the, the uh, people who need prayer, who has been very simple in the living so they can give to the poor, is not considered really much of a Christian, right? It's probably forgotten in the church. That's why the Bible finally says, the last shall be first one fine day when we get up there. We will be thoroughly shocked to see the so-called scholars and the so-called leaders in our church who cannot, we have, can't even find them at the end of the queue, all right, uh, in heaven because they're so far behind and the last will be first, okay? Now, the history of this church, we can read that in Acts chapter 18. In Acts 18, we see Paul went to the city of Corinth, very strategic because it's a big city. Paul always aimed for the cities, went to the synagogue. He preached. After a while, they expelled him, all right? So he had to go to another place nearby. And in the other place, interestingly enough, the chief of the synagogue, right, a guy I think called Crispus, got saved, and his family got saved. And you know what? A lot of people got saved. And God told Paul in a vision that Paul, you stay in this city because I've got lots of people for you to, to, to reach to. So Paul stayed for 18 months. That's quite long for an apostle like Paul. And so he stayed there and he built a good church. And then he decided that it's time to go. So as an apostle, he moves on. When he moved on, as he was in another city, he got news. A report came to him. A lady called Chloe came and said, Hey, do you know what's happening in Corinth? It's terrible. That's immorality, division, blah, blah, blah. And you better do something about it, right? So that's why Paul wrote this letter to help. So Chloe brought a report of problems and she also brought a letter with questions in it for Paul to answer. Like, you know, is it good to get married? What kind of food can we eat? And so on. So this letter we are going to read is a result of Chloe's report and of uh, of the questions that Chloe brought. So you're going to see a lot of questions here that will be answered, all right? They are very practical problems in any church that you will have even today. Now, the theme of this book in 1 Corinthians is, to, the theme is seeing all of life, every aspect of our life through the gospel, all right? through the crucifixion, which is emphasized in the beginning of 1 Corinthians, and through the resurrection, which is emphasized at the end of 1 Corinthians. So can we say they are bookmarked, right? This book, this book of 1 Corinthians has bookmarks, crucifixion in the front, resurrection in the back, and everything between all the problems has to be viewed through the glasses of crucifixion and resurrection. Right? When you see life through the crucifixion of Christ or the resurrection of Christ, then you see life in the right perspective. So you got to wear what I call the gospel lens. The gospel lens about Christ who died and Christ who rose. Okay? So all aspects of our life must be judged, must be viewed right? through this gospel glasses, I would call it. All right. So let's look at the first chapter one, right? chapter one is dealing with, chapter actually chapter one to verse, uh, chapter four is dealing with divisions, okay? So let's just see how it all begins. Chapter one, verse 13. <clears throat> is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now. He got a report that the church is now split into cliques. You see, after Paul left, a guy called Apollos, a very good man, came in, and even Cephas or Peter came in to help the church, right? And you know what happened? People began to like, I like Apollos.
policy, you know, the intellectuals are probably like Apollos teaching because, you know, he was an intellectual. He had come from Alexandria, the, 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 the Harvard of uh, uh, the ancient world. Cephas probably was the fisherman type, not so good. And so the people, these newly rich people, they like to choose what they like to choose. You know, when you get newly rich, you get all excited that you have a lot of choices. Okay, newly rich people like to buy the latest, the most fashionable, the trendiest, what suits their taste, whether it's restaurant, clothes, whatever, all right? And even preachers. So you go to a typical church, like in a Corinthian setting or a Singapore setting, people like certain teachers, people dislike certain teachers, all right? So there were a lot of divisions. And Paul said, why is all this? Was Christ divided? Was Paul, some of you say you're Paul's fans, some of you say you're Paul's fans, was Paul crucified for you? All right. So basically, um, Paul is telling them, please stop all this. All right. We see everything through the gospel. If a man preaches the gospel faithfully, that's the man. It's not about his accent, about his style, about his dress, about his his latest uh, hairstyle. No, it's about the gospel. All right. So we see, was Paul crucified for you? He starts right there. And then in chapter 2, let's look at chapter 2. What is, makes Paul unique? All right. This is what he says you should be looking for. Chapter 2, verse 1. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I hope you understand now. When you go to a church, you don't look because his style is so polished, because his sermon is so, so brilliant and so sharp. The question is, is he preaching Christ and Him crucified? Or is he preaching Christ and him being Santa Claus, all right? This is all you want to look for. It's foundational, okay? Because, you know, when we, as newly rich people, we like all the fancy little frills of life and we get focused on the frills, his speech, his style, his whatever. No, get to the substance, okay? So, uh, then... Paul goes on to say in chapter 4, verse 7, because everybody was like, oh, I'm better than you, I'm smarter than you, or I'm richer than you, you know, and I, 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 you know, I'm just an intellectual type, I just like Apollos, you know, that kind of stuff. And so finally, Paul says in chapter 4, verse 7, For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? All right? Clicks happen because we feel we are better than others. That, that's the a, that's a reason for clicks. We look down on others, right? Because we think we're smarter, we're more hardworking, all right? We're richer, all right? And so we form our clicks rather than have a family in Christ, right? You know, you go to church and like, oh, yeah, those guys, they just talk so shallow, you know, uh, yeah, they don't really know the Bible, you know, and so we, we form little cliques, and, and Paul said, what makes you any different? If you've got a good brain, who gave it to you? If you're rich, who gave you the opportunity to be rich, right, or the, or the health to be rich, or the connections to be rich? Where did all it come from? Stick in Christ, the blessing we have in the gospel in Christ, right? So this is the first part of it. The divisions are caused by our arrogance, looking down on others, right? And because we feel that, you know, people should serve us as newly rich, we like his style, it suits me, right? So it's very self, right? <clears throat> then chapter 5 is a question on immorality. Let's look at chapter 5. And verse 1, there was quite a shocking immorality. It's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not 
tolerated even among pagans, for a man has his father's wife. So this man was having uh, immorality with his stepmother. <laughs> even in pagan culture, that was not acceptable. That's degrading to your father, all right? So, but it was so normal because if you can have sex in the temple, then you can have sex with, I mean, if sex was uh, uh, acceptable to your God, the temple, right, then sex anyway is acceptable with anyone, right? So basically, this was what happened. Now, the Corinthians, remember, uh, the Greek philosophy divides the spiritual from the physical, right? So as long as they went to church, knew the doctrines, talked big in church about spiritual things, what they did with their body is a separate issue. That's a different thing. It's not like it's one, okay? Basically, the Greeks divided spiritual from the physical. Now, that's why in 1 Corinthians 3.16 and 1 Corinthians 6.19, Paul repeats here, Don't know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Right? Now, our body is sacred. But, you know, even today in the church, we go to church, very spiritual, take notes, memorize the verses, argue, debate on certain verses, and then we go out and we indulge the body. Right? Totally. The body is not for God. The body is for indulging, whether it's food or dress or, or pampering with cosmetics or whatever. Right? It's, it's, it's my business. It's my body. I do what I like with it. No, your body is the temple of God. Right? Offer yourself a living sacrifice, spirit and body. Okay? But for them, no. I already attended church. Now let me go and indulge my body with a prostitute. What's your problem? It's got nothing to do with God. Separate. Separate. Get it? Right? In the Greek mind. In God's mind, no, your body is a temple. It's very, don't overly indulge it. It's for God. It's not for self, right? Hard for you and I to grasp it, but we already influence all of us. Very separate thing. Some of the most spiritual, I sorry, I use the word spiritual in the sense of Greek. They know the Bible and that they live like kings, right? And they say, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? Why can't I indulge my body? I give my mind to God. I serve God. I work very hard in the theology in the Bible school. I work very hard in the conferences. Let me indulge my body. Okay, whatever. That's your Greek idea. But my body is a temple of God. I have to be careful how I handle it, how I use it, right? Now, number six is about law. They sued one another. Romans, okay? Now, in the church, there's a lot of law in church today constitutions and all kinds of things are going into the church constitution. To be honest, church constitutions can be as complicated as others. In church business meetings, it's not about the spiritual state, it's about the little points of the law. In fact, often at, at so-called elders meetings, all right, it's all about law. And, you know, suddenly you have to say, uh, are we here to be lawyers or be here to be guardians of the spiritual state of the church, right? We all seem to know the fine points of the law, but we are missing out on the huge points of the spiritual condition of our people, ourselves included, right? I mean, it's, it's Roman, it's Roman. We also have this kind of law thing, you know? In many churches, the business meeting is like a court of law, right? Where is that in the Constitution? How come it's, it's not this? It's not proper order according to our, our Constitution, you know? Same thing, same thing, right? Mm -hmm. Then, mm -hmm. Chapter 7 is about status, you know? People go to church often. I like the idea, Sunday best, wear properly, you're going to church, but not fashion best, all right? Respectful, but no, for many it's to show off uh, in church, all right? Whatever, show off knowledge, show off their, their wealth, whatever, all right? Let's look at chapter 7 and verse 21. 
So you're just seeing actually a mirror, all right? A mirror of a church, Corinth mirrors a church in a wealthy uh, place, okay? Mm -hmm. Chapter 7, verse 21. Were you a bond servant when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. Paul is saying that what you are in this world, your social status, no big deal. All right? No big deal. Because later we're going to see there will be a resurrection one day and no social status up there. All right? Up there in heaven, we are all equal status. So, no big deal, he says. All right? Now, let's look at verse uh, 29 to 31. Chapter 7, verse 29 to 31. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. And those who mourn as though they are, were not mourning. And those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing. And those who buy as though they had no goods. And those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. What does all this mean? He means that we who are born again, we shouldn't be overly concerned about life in this world. Oh, have you visited this place? Have you gone there? Have you eaten this? Have you done that? You know? And for many, we live as if this is our bucket list. We have to experience it before we go, we say. We have to do it before it's no more, right? Now, later, we will see at the end in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul emphasizes the resurrection, the bodily resurrection. All right? Some of us think that if we one day will leave this body, the Greek idea, you know, our soul will go up there. Wow, well, cannot enjoy food anymore. Cannot enjoy many things anymore. Right? But, but enjoy now. Christian, have you seen this? Have you eaten this? Have you experienced this? You know, you hear this in church all the time. Right? And Paul said, yeah, no big deal. It's like nothing. Right? Because you're going to have a body, resurrected body, and experience things so amazing that when you look back on your bucket list, you almost laugh. You will say, yeah, so stupid at that time. Why we spend all our time? We should have spent our time evangelizing people, helping the needy, because now no chance to evangelize, no chance to help the needy, no chance to do anything for, you know, uh, to, to see people get saved. But we have all the chance to enjoy all the great things that God has prepared for us. But we don't have, our Greek idea is the bodies left behind. I'm talking about you guys. I'm talking to you, all right? That you think, wow, we die only spirit, leh. you know, we go up there, you know, <clears throat> and become very spiritual. Separated, you know, we die, the body is left here, we go up. No, 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 no. There will be a bodily resurrection, okay? Same body, except better. No pain, no sin, no aches. When you travel, right, and see the universe and the planets and whatever, right, no fatigue, right? Okay, so that is what Paul says. No big deal in this world. Okay, chapter 8 food offered to idols. There was an argument, right, because Every food that was offered, temples everywhere. You don't know whether meat offered to idols or not. Basically, Paul's principle is very, very simple. If you eat the meat and it will affect someone's faith, that is someone's very weak in the faith, right? And he's with you. And he knows this meat is offered to idols, but he's so weak in the understanding, he thinks, hey, you're eating this meat means you also worship the idol. So you mean that many gods are. Your God and idols all the same. Huh? So when you eat this means you also worship the idol. Then you better don't eat when the guy is there. Because you might stumble his faith. 
But if there's no one there and you know that all these idols are nothing, right? Nothing. Then, either. No big deal. Okay? So, basically, that's what chapter 8 is all about. Okay? Don't stumble anyone. Let's look at 8.13, maybe just to summarize it. Huh? Because when you read it, you can uh, get a little bit confused. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, that means his faith now is confused. Do you really worship the true living God or do you also worship idols because you eat the food? I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. That's all. Alright? Okay? You know better. It's just meat. It's protein. Right? Chapter 9. Paul's apostleship is questioned. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? I am not you, my workmanship in the Lord. People are questioning. Are you sure Paul is an apostle? He said, what? They're questioning my apostleship? Why were they questioning Paul's apostleship? Right? I mean, you and I would say, this is ridiculous. Paul's such a godly man. How come they question his apostleship? The answer is very simple. It's found at the end of chapter 9. All right? Verse 19. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. Verse 20. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. Now, why did they question Paul's apostleship? Because he didn't look like an apostle to their mind, to their newly rich mind. He looked like a servant. He was serving everybody, the weakest, the poorest. He was, he was not standing up there in his, his slick suit. If he was with the poorest, he served the poorest, looking like the poorest. He became all things to all men. He didn't fit their mind of a church leader who has that look, that cut, we call it, that impressive look. Wow, you should see my pastor. He's really impressive. How many say, and you see my pastor, sometimes you don't know whether he's the gardener or the servant. Very few I feel, feel proud if your pastor looks like a servant. That's our mind, right? And so they begin to say, is he really the apostle? You mean he saw the Lord? Come on, this can't be true. He looks so ordinary. My goodness, right? So this is our mindset. Do we have it? Of course, right here. 2,000 years later, still the same, all right? The Corinthian mindset. <clears throat> all right, let's go to chapter 10. What can we do as Christians? You know, there are a lot of laws. The Greeks, the, I mean, the Jews had 613 laws in the Torah, not to mention tens of thousands of laws added by their religious leaders. What about you and me? Are we under the Torah laws? All those nit and picky laws? Right? What is lawful for us? Let's look at chapter 10 and verse 23-24. All, thing, <coughs> all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. So, every time you want to ask yourself, you know, should I do this or should I do it? not do it? You say, is it? Does it build up? Does it help others? Does it help their faith? Does it help them in their life? In other words, we keep thinking about how to help others, how to serve others, how to build up others. Okay, so then. And 
chapter 11, uh, we have, uh, all right, maybe chapter 10, verse 31. So whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Do everything to build up others, glorify God. Chapter 11 is something about coverings of the head, and we have all kinds of bizarre interpretations. Should women wear covering, veils, hats, and all that kind of stuff? The principle is very simple. In chapter 11, verse 3, let's look at it. I'm running through because I think some of these things are not a big deal to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. So this whole chapter, chapter 11, the first half, is about headship. And it says men shouldn't have long hair or wear a hat or a covering. Why? Because he's the head so that you can see his head, right? When you look at me, you see my head. It's very clear. You can see the sides, the sides, the back, all right? But if you have a hat or long hair or a veil or whatever, I can't see your head, right? And if you're a man, you're supposed to be the head. So when I see a man, I'm supposed to remind him he's the head. That's, to me, that's what it all is because there was a lot of women there who are newly rich and wanted to be the head of the house, okay? And the early feminist movement, today is the same problem, right? The homes are wrecked because women want to be the head. So this is about the head of the wife is the husband. So show your head. Women, cover your head because you're not the head. That's all I see, right? Chapter 11, the second part is about the Lord's Supper. There were people who were getting drunk over eating at the Lord's Supper, chapter 11, second part, right? Now, the Lord's Supper in those days, it was a home meal. And then part of it was the breaking of bread and taking of the wine. Now, for them, it lost its purpose. And so people went to eat, indulge, grab food, get the best food like a buffet meal, and then get drunk. He said, ah, we don't do that nowadays. Now, I say we don't do that because you can't get drunk on today's a lot. Supper is just one tiny piece of bread. But we have also lost its purpose. For many people, the Lord's Supper is just a ritual. For them, it was just a meal. The goal was lost. And so Paul emphasizes the goal in 1 Corinthians 11. Then we come to chapter 12, spiritual gifts. Okay, now, this church had a lot of spiritual gifts. People were given the gift of wisdom, the gift of knowledge, the gift of all kinds of gifts. Gifts of tongues, gifts of healings, right? And what happened? When you have a gift, if you're gifted, what do you think you will do if you don't have Christ in you? You show off. <laughs> I don't care. Uh, if you have a gift, you definitely will show off. All gifted people have a struggle not to be proud people. So what's the difference if you've got a spiritual gift? You won't show off? Of course you will, unless you have this understanding that the gift is for serving, not for showing, right? Chapter 12, verse 22. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. Right? But God has composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. Right? If one member suffer, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. So what are gifts for? Gifts are to help the weaker parts of the body. Right? If you have the gift of teaching, help those who have lack knowledge, understanding. If the gift of helps, help those who need help. Right? If the gift of healing, help those who are sick. All right? So the idea of spiritual gifts was for serving the body. Okay? In chapter 12, it, it describes the church as a body. Right? 
I have strong arms. So what do I do with my arms? I protect my eye because my eye is vulnerable if something was going to hit it, right? So the purpose of all of the parts of my body are for helping the vulnerable parts of my body, okay? Big chest, ribs. What's the purpose of all these ribs? To protect my heart because my heart's very vulnerable, okay? So all of these things, the important parts of the body actually are vulnerable to the, the weak parts, the heart, the liver, it's all inside protected, okay? And we protect all our parts, our vulnerable parts, okay? So the same thing, when we are given strength in something is to help protect the weaker members of the church, not to show off our strengths, okay? Then it ends up in chapter 12, verse 30, in very interesting. Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret, but earnestly desire the higher gifts? And I will show you a still more excellent way. This is end of chapter 12, all right? Watch it. End of chapter 12 says, do all speak in tongues? But before he goes into tongues, he goes into the great chapter, chapter 13, on love. Everybody knows 1 Corinthians 13, I think. It's a great chapter on describing agape love. Okay? Chapter 13, verse, one, verse 2, And if I have prophetic powers, understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. So it sounds if all the gifts, but you have not love, you are nothing. Now in English, the word love doesn't cover this meaning at all. Right? The Greeks had several words for love, but three common ones. Eros, that's sexual love. Okay? There's nothing wrong with that. God made sex, right? Sexual love. Philadelphia. You thought it was a city, right? Phila is from the word filial, love. Delphia, Adelphia is brothers, love of brothers. This is what kind of love, right? Brotherly love. Sexual love, brotherly love. Third kind of love is agape love. Very seldom used in Greek literature because it was never found. They never saw it in anybody. <laughs> it was there in the language, but it was very seldom found in their literature. In English, it doesn't even exist. The word love, all right, can mean either one or two, Eros or Philadelphia, all right? It could be lust, or it could be, I love my brother. I love a hamburger, all right? This one is like, I use the word like, but we use the word love to describe this. I like hamburgers suits my taste. I like white shirts because it suits my, 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 my complexion, right? So all these things is like, lust, like. But this one, love, agape love, doesn't exist. But this is talking about agape love. What is agape love? It's a love of giving. When you see a need, then you give. Why do you love this? Because I love to give to this. I want to help this person. You see, when we say God is love, do you understand it? Do you even understand what it means? You say, well, God feels emo about us. How can God feel emo about Israel? Israel was such a tiny place, so stubborn, so rebellious. How can God feel e emo about Corinth? How? Oh, horrible people. Everything wrong. You know why God loved Israel? They needed His love. You know why God loved Corinth? They needed His love. Agape love is a giving, sacrificial love. When we say God is love, oh, God's so emo about us. No! In fact, most people have no idea what God is love. When they say God is love, they don't even know what they're talking about. All right? So, the love described here is a love that can only come 
from the cross. When we tasted the love of Christ for a sinner like me, then we can give this love to a horrible person, a needy person, a messed up person. Right? This has to come from God, agape love. So chapter 3, 13 is about agape love. Chapter 14 is about tongues. Right? All about tongues. And people say, can speak in tongues? Of course can. The Bible says can. Who said cannot? But I just want to say my definition of tongues is the Bible definition in Acts chapter 2. It's a language, a real language that you have not learned before. If you can do that, praise God, speak in it, man. All right. <clears throat> now, let's look at the purpose of tongues. Okay. Chapter 14. If you have the gift of tongues, right, just be sure that you use it for the right reason. Okay. And let me look at chapter 14, verse 5. Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. Underline the word built up. If you use the King James, it's called edify. That's the word edify, to build up. Look at 14 and verse 12. So with yourself, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church, not showing off your gift, building up the church. So every time you exercise the gift, ask yourself a question, whether it's the gift of tongues, gift of healing, or whatever, are you helping someone, building up someone, right? Edifying. Chapter 14, verse 26. What then, brothers? When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. All right? This whole chapter on gifts, and particularly the gifts of tongues, three times it's mentioned. Whatever you do, is it building up somebody? Or is it a pointless showing off of the gift God has given you? That's all. He see, you believe in tongues. Of course. It's in the Bible. How can you don't believe in it? I believe it's a language. If you have the gift, use it. But use it to encourage, to build, not to show off. All right. And lastly, chapter 15 is about resurrection. I like this. This ties up everything. All right. Now, this church, though they heard the gospel about Christ and Him crucified and Him risen, they didn't quite get the resurrection part. Right? Chapter 1, 15, verse 1 to 4. Now we remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He was raised up. All right. Now, for the Corinthian Christians, very Greek, bodily resurrection, for what? The body is junk, man. The body is for sex, for all those things, and then we leave it behind, then we become spiritual and go to heaven. 90% of Christians still have this struggle. No, it's a bodily resurrection all right look at verse 19 if in this if in christ we have hope in this life only we have all people most to be pitted in this life only so we have good life now in this life after we're up there just floating around playing a harp whiling away our time and no, my friends, we will be bodily resurrected. You see, what's the big deal? Why does he end with this? All these problems. When you know that one day you will be bodily resurrected, looking somewhat like this, and you will meet the guy you sued in church, looking somewhat like that, you'll be very embarrassed. You're going to have to see his face forever. You'll be his friend forever. Eat with him forever. 
And when you had all those divisions, you'd be very sad. All right? And all the status, you are like, whoa, you're different from others. And one day in heaven, all of you standing eyeball to eyeball. Same. What was all that status before? How much was it worth? Nothing. All right? And then you have to face people and say, my goodness, I had all the money. I never helped him. I never helped him once. I did it all for myself. Now I have to face him for eternity. Him, not some dismembered spirit. It's like two lives, you know? We seem to think that we're going to leave this life behind, so we better do all the things we can. We go to another life that's so big and wooly. That I, I really don't know what it is. No, my friends. It's a new heaven, new earth. Right? And you and I will meet again. And all the poor believers I ignored and didn't help. All the poor church members I didn't talk to. I had to face them for all eternity. I hope you get it. So Paul begins to resurrect with the crucifixion. I determined not to preach anything among you except Christ and Him crucified. It ends up with this. I'm telling you, we're going to be resurrected. One people for eternity. Why are you behaving like this now? Right? What is the purpose of First Corinthians? To me, it is about agape love. It's about the God who served us. First Corinthians, Paul saying, I served you. I did everything for you. And yet you didn't recognize me. He said, what kind of leader is that? You didn't recognize agape love. Everything I want you to do is agape love for others. Do it for others. Not sex for myself, so because my ego is do everything for others. There's needs around. Reach out. So when you say God is love, what do you mean? God is a servant. That's what it means. God chose to be a servant, to serve us. Christ, our Lord, chose to serve us on the cross. Live a sinless life and serve us on the cross. The Holy Spirit, of God chose to live in us and serve us as our partner. What about you? What's your idea of love? Serving? Is it even in your thinking? <clears throat> or you go to church and say, yeah, don't like this church. Huh? Pastor, is, doesn't fit me, man. <laughs> don't like the music. Doesn't suit me, man. <laughs> All right? So I hope today you see the God who loved Israel, a horrible nation, because he needed love. Who loved me because I needed love. And today there are lots of people out there and you can express God's love in your church. Agape love. Reaching out, reaching down, and serving with the gifts and resources that God has blessed you with. Because God is love. May God make you also have an outflow of God's agape love to others. God bless you.